The wonderful world of fan fiction is where all of our wildest nerd fantasies come true. From Godzilla meeting John Wick, to Godzilla eating John Wick, to Godzilla dating John Wick, and then probably eating him anyway. Or vice versa. It's easy to write these stories off as bastardizations of beloved franchises, but creators bastardize their own IP all the time through endless reboots and self-indulgent tweet storms. Fan fiction is a way for fans to add their voice to the cacophony. A voice that I imagine to sound like every Keanu Reeves character rolled into one. <laughs> Enthusiastic, if not exactly professorial. So today, we're talking Harry Potter's grumpiest teacher diddling the Teletubbies, Professor X's X-rated romance with a famous cannibal, and the time Goku fell in love with a historical figure that you're definitely not picturing right now. This is Cannonball. Oh, and I'm your host, professional lifeguard Jesse Eisman. These stories are going to get dangerously horny, and I'm duty bound to protect you while you're in the sploosh zone. Number 4. Professor Snape has an orgy with the Teletubbies. There's something about the Harry Potter universe that inspires particularly deranged fan fiction. There are tales about Ron Weasley's brothers hooking up with Lance Bass from NSYNC, Indiana Jones molesting Lord Voldemort, Don't look right, keep your eyes shut. and even one where Hogwarts Castle gets it on with a giant octopus, which for some reason mostly just reminds me this castle is named after oozing pig sores. But even if you're already intimately familiar with all of those, absolutely nothing can prepare you for this alternate universe where Professor Severus Snape got to know the Teletubbies carnally. He f***ed him. I'm coming. <laughs> the story is called Severus Snape, Professor and Lover. Snape suffers from a bad case of existential despair, despite landing a sweet gig teaching magical trust fund babies in a stinky dungeon. He files a complaint with his superior, Dumbledore, saying, Headmaster, I want to be expelled. I don't have what it takes to teach anymore. Sensing Snape's profound sadness, Dumbledore relents and transfers him to the sunny land of the Teletubbies. Now that the writer has properly established a plausible scenario for the characters to meet, let the boning commence. It turns out, Teletubbies are really curious about sex, and who better to teach them than their new substitute science teacher? Snape, to his credit, insists that they stick to the curriculum. But the yellow Teletubby, Lala, says, Oh, Professor! I'm dying from inside! Don't let the evil Periscope suck the last remnants of humanity locked in my so fatal broken heart! Snape is moved by her poetic words and decides, according to the narrator, It was a long time since the last time he shared an intimacy-filled moment with a woman, or a goof-ass little monkey alien, with a movement of his, quote, wondrous magic wand. And that's not an innuendo, you sickos. Snape creates a giant bed for himself, Lala, Tinky Winky, and Dipsy, but not Poe. He's the shortest Teletubby, and Snape is apparently a size queen. Later, Snape teaches Dipsy how to turn Tinky Winky's butt into an instrument of pleasure. Oh, Dipsy, he don't have crotch mouth, but behind him you will find a pork's eye. Don't be afraid, it's dirty, but after a while, you will like the fine flavor of melted chocolate covering your lips. And it doesn't stop with poop. The lesson descends into an all-out orgy featuring boogers, vomit, and bathing in fountains of breast milk. It's a horrid, tubby custard buffet of every conceivable excretion. But to be fair to the writer, smearing poop on a Teletubby sounds exactly like what a man who's been living in a basement for decades must imagine sex to be like. But the most disturbing part of the story has to be the description of Snape's wand, and fine, that one was an innuendo. And Snape unclouds himself! His pale, shiny penis appeared, and all of the Teletubbies got impressed. His nutsack was very white and hairy, and exhaled a snake oil parfum essence. Lala felt a jolt of pleasure down her antenna. Later, Lala starts feeling like maybe what they're doing is wrong and unnatural. Uh -oh. But her gentle lover reassures her, No, Lala, don't be ashamed. When you bit the forbidden fruit, the knowledge will fulfill your innermost desires. Be my Eve. Eventually, Dumbledore comes to check on Snape and is horrified by what he's doing with these little rainbow bastards. Especially because, plot twist, the Teletubbies are Death Eaters working for Voldemort. 
Tinky Winky kills Dumbledore with a grenade and a Colt 45, which is honestly better than his canonical death, if a bit absurd. Okay, let's check out a story that's a little more grounded in reality. Number three, the Tetris Death Note erotic fan fiction. Death Note is a manga about a kid who kills unworthy people by writing their names in a magic notebook. Think Dexter, but with more Japan. Tetris is about falling blocks. Truly, the only overlap on this Venn diagram is a fun little story where someone tapped into the undercurrent of sexual tension between these two characters. The story getting around the block starts when Mello, one of the main characters from Death Note, inexplicably finds himself trapped inside a game of Tetris. His first thought is that he's been drugged. His second thought is that the magic notebook killer probably wouldn't need to drug him because he's got that magic notebook. And his third thought is, I didn't expect Tetris blocks would have such an odd texture. Here we go. Mello begins groping the human-sized Tetris blocks around him and is surprised to find that they're soft, firm, and oddly slippery all at once. I mean, that's how I've always pictured him. Things really get going when a block lands on top of Mello and thrusts itself on him in a rather inappropriate manner, presumably as revenge for all those chocolate blocks Mello's mutilated with his teeth. Mello tries to kick it away, but the block won't take no for an answer. As if the block had understood but disapproved, it only became much more vigorous in its efforts, grinding against Mello in the most annoying way. And that's when Mello's clothes magically poof out of existence. This is the writer's clever way of getting around the fact that Tetris blocks can't take someone's clothes off, because they don't have hands. High five! Seems the creators of Tetris somehow hadn't anticipated Rule 34. Unless, was there something in the manual about appendages? I honestly never read it. I thought I got how it all worked. Well, pretty soon, Mello stops resisting and surrenders to the raw animal magnetism of that unruly Tetris block grinding against him. One thing leads to another, and Mello gleefully welcomes the irresistible falling block into his body. And we do mean the entire block, by the way, because, again, can't stress this enough, there are no fuckables or suckables protruding from a Tetris block. Eventually, Mello wakes up from his bizarre dream, and we find out that he'd been in an orgy with a bunch of couch cushions. And who hasn't been there? But we know what you're wondering. Are there any fan fiction sex scenes between actual human beings? Well, do mutants count? Number two, Professor X has a three-way with Magneto and Hannibal Lecter, the setting. Charles Xavier, the man who will one day lead the X-Men as Professor X, is sitting in a cafe when his mutant powers detect a disturbed mind sitting near him. Not just any type of disturbed, but <laughs> disturbed. Charles quickly leaves the cafe, but the man follows him home and invites himself in. That man, we find out, is Hannibal Lecter. The story Condonare by an author who has since disavowed their abominable creation combines the settings from the movies X-Men First Class and Hannibal Rising, meaning that both characters are still in their 20s, so you can stop picturing Patrick Stewart and Anthony Hopkins making out. If you want, I for one choose not to. After a bumpy introduction, Charles and Hannibal start getting along better. Way better. When he raised his head to see, Hannibal's mouth was already closing around his c**k. And Hannibal's mouth Charles whimpered and clutched at the sheets. Okay, stop right there. So Charles knows that Lecter is a cannibal. He's been inside his head. He knows that he's eaten at least one other person so far. And he still lets the guy put his mouth around his little beast. This is exactly the type of perilous situation that Charles's mental powers are designed to prevent. And yes, this exact situation. All mutants eventually end up in bed with cannibals. Do you even read comic books? So after a few nights of passion, Hannibal goes away, but Charles remains fascinated by the man and his magic lips. Months later, Hannibal returns with a friend, a young Eric Lenscher, AKA the future Magneto. So this story contends that the two mutant frenemies were first introduced by Hannibal the Cannibal, over a casual menage a trois. Suck it, Max. Eat a dick, Charles. Hannibal had gotten lube somewhere. Proper lube. He's never f***ed you, has he? He asked. Uh, oh. Charles said, turned on his f***. No, we've never. It is time that he did. The door slammed shut, and in the next second, Hannibal was there, groin, grazing against Charles's ass, pressing Charles's own erection against Eric's. My love is a fever. 
After the three are done playing Human Centipede, Hannibal and Eric leave to continue tracking down and killing the Nazis that tortured them when they were kids. Yeah, that's what they were doing together. This could have been Magneto and Lecter, Nazi hunters. But the author decided that was boring compared to this sloppy mutant smorgasborgasm. Okay, that's enough of the horny stuff. How about something more innocent and romantic next? Number one, Goku and... Number one, Goku and Anne Frank fall in love and fight Super Hitler. Now, there's nothing explicitly sexual in this one, but it's still a strong contender for wrongest fan fiction idea ever conceived. The story Goku slash Anne Frank starts in 1944 with Anne lamenting that life is boring in the secret annex where she's hiding from the Nazis. Things turn decidedly less boring when suddenly a strange man appears in a flash of light. His clothes were very strange, and his hair was in a spiky style that was totally new to her. She stood against the wall, wary of the stranger, but he walked towards her and smiled, extending a hand. My name is Goku! Yep, Goku from Dragon Ball Z in Anne Frank's attic. Now, while I can't hope to comprehend why this would happen, I can attempt to tell you how. Goku explains that he was, quote, caught into a time portal, and needs a few minutes to recharge his cells before going back to his time. Those fleeting moments are more than enough for Anne to become smitten. She tries to kiss him, but Goku turns her down. Oh, not because she's a teenager, but because he's a taken man. You know, you're a very beautiful girl, but I, well, Anne looked at him, troubled. What's the matter? She said with a sweet smile, I, I'm already married. Anne pulled away from him abruptly. No! She said loudly, almost in tears. Goku leaves in another flash of light, and Anne says she'll never forget him until the end of time. As it turns out, this is just the author masterfully toying with our emotions, because just a month later, Goku returns to save Anne from the Gestapo. At that moment, he confesses his love, and the fact that he's got a wife and kids is never mentioned again. I know it's kind of a raw deal for you and your mom, Gohan. The action kicks up a notch when Goku says, we got, got some, some Nazi, Nazi ass, ass to kick. kick! And flies Anne to Berlin to battle the entire Third Reich. Goku hijacks a tank and goes on a Nazi killing spree until only Hitler himself is left standing. But there's more to this wimpy Austrian than meets the eye. Hitler burst into a laugh as Goku looked on quizzically. The mustachioed man slowly rose into the air as his brown hair and pencil mustache turned a blonde color and his brown eyes turned blue. Goku reeled in horror. Hitler continued laughing, then finally said, Goku, you came here expecting to find a madman, but instead you found a god. So wait, was Hitler's Aryan ideal always about Super Saiyans? A race of muscular bros who turn blonde haired and blue eyed when they power up? That makes a frightening amount of sense. After a mighty battle that would have taken at least 20 episodes in the anime, Goku disintegrates Super Hitler with a giant ball of energy while yelling, this is for love! Then he destroys the time machine and moves to Australia with Anne. They change their names and live new lives, ready to start over. The two young people looked into each other's eyes as they kissed, as the Reverend pronounced them man and wife. Finally, it seemed, Anne was at peace, and they would always be together until the end of time. So what do we learn here today? You can't count on Funimation or Alan Rickman or JK Rowling to do the right thing. If you want something done horny, you gotta do it yourself. Hey, thanks for watching this episode of Cannonball. I need to ask you for one more favor though. Please, use the comment section to collaborate on the most up fan fiction your sick, twisted hive mind can conjure. Thanks in advance.